Well, if you were a little confused as to how the Christmas story went, I don't think we helped you out. <laughs> so um, if you uh, want to come back uh, Thursday for Christmas Eve, um, we'll just kind of go through the Christmas story and maybe answer any questions that that little retelling might have caused. Uh, but this is what I want to do this morning, is um, we've been in this series, Comfort and Joy, and we've been talking about kind of what is, not what happened, uh, but what is the Christmas story really about? And uh, the big idea for this series has been really simple, that we often think the way that we're going to find joy in our lives is by taking a pathway of comfort, of choosing decisions that are going to make us the most comfortable. And uh, what we see in our lives today, what we see throughout history, history, and most importantly to me, what we see throughout scripture is exactly the opposite. Um, that comfort rarely, if ever, leads to joy. And I think that's what's so incredible about the Christmas story is that as we look through these different characters and their lives and the things that they faced, um, they did not take the easy decision. They did not take the simple decision for them. And so we've just kind of tracked through them. We looked at uh, Joseph the first week of the series and how Joseph kind of had a plan for his life. And all of a sudden, in the moment with this news that Mary was pregnant, his plan was just kind of thrown away. And so he kind of has to almost rebuild his life and has this key decision of like, what do you do when the plan for your life? Life is taken away from you. And uh, Mary's was very, very different, actually, that she kind of, she didn't think almost in a sense that she could be used by God. And all of a sudden, when the angel visits her, she's like shocked, she's afraid, she's taken aback, because all of a sudden the angel says like, God has this great plan, this incredible plan for your life that he wants you to be a part of. And so for her, it's about leaving that comfort of just kind of having a simple, having an easy life and stepping into that. And uh, today, as we've kind of worked through these different characters in the Christmas story, today we want to look at Jesus. But the hard thing as we look at this is that Jesus' story is not a story about leaving his comfort to find joy. And uh, so he's, he's kind of the exception to the rule, which is usually the case when it comes to Jesus. But, uh, but as we look throughout scripture, we don't actually ever see Jesus leave his comfort. And, um, and I would say it like this, that there are definitely moments in Jesus' life that as we go through the accounts of scripture, that we would say like, he, didn't, he didn't, probably didn't love this moment <laughs> as much as others. Like we see, um, we see before his crucifixion, we see as he's facing everything that's gonna happen, it describes him that he's in agony, <laughs> which I would say is not comfortable, <laughs> okay? So he's in agony there. We see him suffering on the cross, but it's interesting, as Jesus goes throughout his life, he faces periods of um, discomfort very different than the rest of us. And uh, this is what I see, and this is what I think is just so fascinating, is that when, when you look at like Mary's story, when, when she gets news that God wants to use you, her immediate response is that she's afraid she's scared. Uh, when you look at Joseph's story and he gets the news that the plan for his life has been taken away, his immediate response is that he's afraid. And this is a common theme throughout scripture. As we look at the stories of people like Moses and, and Joseph and, and David and all these different accounts of these great heroes of our faith, whenever news comes in that, that their life is going to be used by God in a unique way, their automatic response almost every single time, and scripture goes out of its way to clarify this for us, is that they are afraid. They're scared of what's going to happen. And so it, it got me thinking, like, what is it about them being afraid that, that caused Jesus to never be afraid? Like, what is it about when, when we're faced with situations where we're called to leave our comfort, how automatically we get scared, because we do, but Jesus, that just isn't the case. And here's what I thought as I kind of looked at my own life is like there are like time, definite times that I'm afraid. Like um, I am not like, I'm not like deathly afraid, but like I don't like pain. I assume like most of you, um, if you do like pain, uh, then you need to talk to somebody because that's a problem <laughs> and it's not normal. But like, so like I can remember as a kid, like sitting in the doctor's office, getting ready to get a shot. And like, there was fear there. Like I wasn't like in hysterics or anything like that, but it was like, this is, this is going to hurt. I don't, I don't like this. Um, today I am uh, irrationally afraid. Uh, people say that they're afraid of heights. I'm not afraid of heights. I think the fear is of the ground and just being far away from the ground. Okay. So like, 
but I am like I'm scared. Like I get on the roof to do Christmas lights, and uh, if anyone saw me do putting Christmas lights on my roof, uh, you would see it took me a very very long time because other people are just kind of like strutting around on the roof like they own the world. Like me, I never leave my bottom. I just kind of scoot across the whole roof because on my feet, I'm even further away from the ground there. So like we get scared in moments like that. Um, but as I look at my life in other moments of is situations where pain is out of the picture in terms of physical pain. Why do I get afraid? And as I've seen accounts of, of relationships, of, um, of work, of different decisions that I was faced with, I think the conclusion that I can come to is the reason why I get afraid is because I'm afraid that in a moment that whatever happens or whatever I decide or whatever I'm faced with, that if I choose wrong, or if things don't go the way that they're supposed to, that I'm going to miss out on joy. That, that somehow in my life, that, that if something goes off, if something goes different, if a relationship goes south, then somehow I'm going to miss out on joy in my life. And I think as if you looked at your life and the times that you're afraid, you, you would agree with the same thing. Like, well, what if I choose this major and that instead of that major and I'm not happy with my life? What if I choose this person instead of that person? What if I choose this job instead of that job? And we get in these moments where we're afraid, where we're scared. And I think the central thing within that is the reason why we get scared is because we're afraid that we're going to miss out on joy, which is what makes Jesus' story so unique, is Jesus never gets scared. And we look at that and go, okay, so why does Jesus never get scared? And the easy end of that, well, because he's Jesus. Like, of course he's not getting scared. But I think there's something significant within that. That the reason why Jesus is never afraid is because he knows his joy will not be taken from him. That he knows no matter what he does, that his joy is linked to something that cannot be stolen from him. That no matter what decision that he makes, no matter what happens with his relationships, that his joy is secure. And in fact, we, we see record of this that's so incredible that as he lives his life, it's almost like he's just going further and further into joy. That like he has joy, but as he continues to pursue his relationship with his father and be obedient to that, that his joy just grows more and more. Uh, there's a verse in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, and it says this in reference. It says, Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And, and I think that phrase is so massive that we see Jesus make this incredible sacrifice of the cross, but we know that he has joy before that. And so it's like he's almost in this spot that's so like almost unfathomable to me that he has this like everlasting joy but as he continues in his relationship with his father, his joy just grows more and more with everything that he does. And I think that's what's so amazing about Christmas, is that's what the story is. It's the story of joy. Now, as I look at that, I, um, I have this problem that, that I hear all that, and as I speak it, I, I hear the words that are coming out of my mouth, and I think, yeah, but that's not possible for us. <laughs> like, right? <laughs> like, we get scared. <laughs> Like, hopefully not a ton, but we get scared some when decisions come before us. And so what can we learn from Jesus' life who has an everlasting joy that just grows more and more as he continues throughout his life? How can we get that? How can we enter into that? And, and while I'll agree that I don't think we're ever going to fully grasp that while we're here on this earth, Today, I want to look at an account of somebody um, who experiences that to some degree. And I'm hoping that through this guy's life, we may learn something about what it means to not be afraid, to resist comfort, and to find joy. And uh, today, I want to introduce you to a guy by the name of Augustine. And Augustine um, lived in the 4th century. We don't know exactly what he looked like, as you can see from the various pictures. Apparently, the artist on the left thought he was very bald. The artist on the right thought he was very studious. <laughs> so we don't know exactly what he looked like. Um, but he's this incredible figure in history. Um, he rose to a position where he was the bishop of a city called Hippo uh, in the 4th century. And so he had a, this very prestigious role. Here's one of the most incredible things to me about Augustine's life. 
is that from the fourth century, we have about 30 books, okay? So like from that many years ago, 16, 1700 years ago, we have th around 30 books that we know were written in that time period. Most of them, we don't know who wrote it. Of the 30 books that we have, Augustine wrote two of them. Like, that's pretty impressive, right? To think of like the hundreds of titles that get released every year from the, the fourth century, we have 30 books, and this guy wrote two of them. Uh, one of the books is titled The City of God, which talks about what it looks like uh, for Christians to live as if heaven was on earth right now, and it's this incredible story. Uh, the second book, which is his more popular one, is titled Confessions. And in this book, Augustine takes an almost scientific exploration of his own life and of his own soul and details for us his relationship with God. So most of what we know about Augustine comes from this book. And we would almost have a tendency like not to trust it because sometimes autobiographies are unnecessary unnecessarily uh, flatterizing to people, and they just kind of boost them up over time. Uh, for Augustine, he's incredibly honest. Like uh, One of the things that he details in this book, which I think is, makes his story so important for us today, is his relationship with his parents. And he describes his father as his father, um, this is the exact words that he uses. He says, his father saw in him only hollow things. And what he means by that is his father didn't see anything substantial, anything internal. He only saw how he could succeed outwardly and the different external things that he could do in his life. So his father would almost play the role of like the parent who never really had, or for different reasons, like just wants their kid to succeed and is somehow living through their kid, whether it's academics or sports or other things, that that's kind of his relationship with his father. I'm sure you guys don't know anyone who lives like that at all today. So um, that's Augustine's relationship with his father. His relationship with his mother, his mother's name is Monica, uh, I think is just almost hilarious. Uh, he describes it like this, that um, for he acknowledges that every single mom in their day and age somewhat wanted to dominate their son's life. But he says, my mom wanted to dominate my life far more than most, which I was like, I think that's just a beautiful way of saying it. Uh, this is an account from his life. So he is not, um, it's weird that we're talking about a story because he's not necessarily a pure person in his life. So when he is 28 years old, 28 years old, he's still living with his mother, uh, but he has, how he describes it, a mistress and a son. Okay, so he's 28 years old, living with his mom, with his mistress and his son. And he decides that he wants to run away from home. But he knows his mom won't allow him. And so he lies to his mom that he's going down to the harbor to see a friend go off when he's actually setting sail. His mom learns as he's going down to the harbor that he is actually leaving. So she chases him down. He's already on the boat sailing away to Africa, okay? So he's on the boat, and he describes that he can see her wildly pacing back and forth, yelling at people to bring the boat back. So Augustine sets sail for Africa, and we'd assume this is when he's gone because this is the day, like, there's no cell phones, there's no find my friends app, like, they don't have anything. It's like, he's in Africa. His mom tracks him down, <laughs> sails to Africa, tracks him down, gets rid of his mistress, gets rid of his son, and brings him back home and forces him to live with her. So when he says... My mom wanted to dominate my life far more than most. I think he was being very, very accurate in that assessment. Uh, but Augustine's unique uh, because he is like, he's just incredibly gifted. That there was a, there was a kind of a royalty person in the area. There was a noble uh, who took notice of Augustine and just how he excelled in academics. And so he paid for his education 
which is something that was pretty rare in that day and age because the nobles kind of tried to keep it elite to their group of people as the only people who could progress. But he saw Augustine and paid for his education. And so Augustine just kind of like keeps rising in life. And he's just got this incredible story of like, he just gets success after success after success. And every role that he's in, he's promoted almost immediately to the point in time where he, he's in this position and it's not directly equivalent, but he's kind of like a 25-year-old senator. Which, like, if we heard of somebody, like, if you knew somebody who was 25 years old and was a senator in D.C., like, you'd be pretty impressed. And and that's kind of the role and the notoriety that Augustine has at this point in time, that he's like this 25-year-old senator. And as he's accomplished all the success and has all these different things going for him, there's three things in his life that begin to stick out. The first one is he became aware, maybe for the first time, became conscious of his infatuation with women. Now, we would look at many younger gentlemen, and we could maybe categorize and characterize them as that. But Augustine's was different. Um, There's tales of some of his exploits, which we're not going to get into this morning, uh, because the service would no longer be... PG or PG-13 or anywhere on that spectrum, okay? So he, he, was, he was a pretty wild guy, we could assume. But, but as he, like, takes account of himself, uh, this is one of his quotes in terms of his infatuation with women. He says, I was not yet in love, but I was in love with love. And from the depths of my need, I hated myself. What I needed most was to love and to be loved, this, uh, this statement by Augustine has won him the title as history's most needy boyfriend. <laughs> Wouldn't you love that? And it sounds kind of poetic at first, that I was in love with love. But as you read it closely, you realize how incredibly selfish it was. That, that Augustine didn't want love, he wanted someone to love him which we would maybe look at in a moment and go, well, that's not so bad. <laughs> like, that sounds kind of nice. But, but think about how distinct of a statement that is. Think about how selfish of a statement that is. It's not what I want to be in love. It's not that I want to love someone else. It's just that I want someone to love me. And we begin to get a glimpse about how Augustine's life simply revolved around himself. There was a second incident uh, that he remembered from when he was a teenager. And he refers to this as the pear incident. And, and what happened was this, is he was walking by a pear farm with a group of his friends, and, and he describes it like this. He says, we weren't hungry, and even if we were hungry, the pears did not look good. They didn't look good to eat at all. And so there was no reason to do what we did. But for some reason, we stole the pears. And we thought it was amazing. Like we, we got this, he described like we got this adrenaline rush. We were so excited because we were stealing the pears. And then he goes, and we didn't even eat them. We, we just took them by and there was a bunch of pigs nearby. And so we threw the pears to the pigs because we wanted the pigs to eat them. Now, now, most of us would look at something like that. I don't know if you had an incident where you toilet paper to house or egg to car or did something like that. That We would look back at these things and we would just go, oh, that was just youthful ignorance. <laughs> That was adolescent stupidity. But for Augustine, this bothered him. Because he said this, why did we do that? Like, we weren't hungry. There was nothing to be gained. But we found great enjoyment from this act simply because of the fact that it was wrong. That because we knew we were doing what we shouldn't be doing, it was incredibly exciting. And this bothered him. This, in a sense, haunted him for most of his life. Because he says, what is it about what is evil that I derive such excitement from, even though I gain nothing from it? And the third incident that really troubled him in his life was this. He said that he was walking along in the streets of Milan one day. And as he's going through the streets of Milan, he notices a beggar who's leaning against a a building, leaning against a wall. And and the beggar has a a small plate of food and a small drink that someone has given him. 
He said that he just kind of stood as a distance and he watched this beggar as the beggar ate the, probably the only meal he would have that day and drank the only liquid that he would have that day. And he said, I just watched him carefully. And then he, when he was done, he set the plate aside and he put the cup next to it and he leaned his head back against the wall and he smiled. And he said, I watched him. And I watched what incredible pleasure that beggar had from a small plate of food and a small amount of liquid. And he thought, here I am, and I have everything going for me. I have risen further faster than absolutely anyone else in the entire city, and yet I have never known pleasure like that. I have never once in my entire life known what it was like to be satisfied like that beggar was. And so for Augustine, this is kind of this crisis point in his life that these three incidents kind of come together. And he realizes that his life just keeps going up and up. The things just keep getting better and better for him. But he makes this statement about his life. He says this, I was famished within. That everything externally for me could not be better. But internally... I was dying inside. And so for most of us, this is what we do. Is when we get to a spot like this, uh, this is what we usually refer to as a midlife crisis. And it's interesting. Some of us seem to have a midlife crisis at 25, others at 40, others at maybe 70. And and what we'll do when we have this crisis is we'll like, we'll switch jobs or switch relationships, or take up a new hobby, or buy a new toy, or do something like that, because we realize the thing that we're doing is not bringing us joy. And so we have this idiotic idea that if we just do something else just as hard, then we'll gain joy. But Augustine does something different. is He takes what he describes as a militaristic approach to his own soul that what he begins doing is he begins actually cataloging his own sins in his own struggles. And he wants to figure out, he says, externally is obviously not the problem. I want to find what is happening within me that is causing me such great grief. And he begins to notice a couple things. The first one is this, is he realizes that while he claimed to want love, that all he was really after was lust. Now, we today typically only define lust as sexual, and in terms of a romantic relationship or something like that. Augustine is brilliant because he sees it as deeper. He sees it like this, that love is what you give Love is all outgoing to someone else. And the distinction between them is then lust is all incoming. Lust is only about what you can, can, uh, can receive. It takes no account for what you can give. And, and so he kind of makes this distinction. In the same way that we would refer to it usually sexually, that like lust is when you use, say, a prostitute for your sexual fulfillment. He says we seem to do that in all different accounts of our life. We... Use a coworker, not for the relationship, but how it will advance our career. We, we use a friend so we don't feel lonely, so we feel accepted. We use a spouse so that we can simply receive their love and not give it. The second thing he noticed in his life was this. As he said, as I took account of my life and as I realized this distinction between love and lust, I realized that within me that there are these two desires, these two forces at work. He said, it seemed that every single thing with what I did is that there there was a good within me that wanted to act and there was a bad, an evil within me, a wickedness that always wanted to act. And he said that as I categorized and realized these two desires, my assumption was that all I had to do was to be consciously aware of the good and the evil within me, and then I could act for good. But he said what I found was exactly the opposite. That as I became more aware of the good and the evil within me, I realized that I was powerless to change the evil. 
He says that I assumed that if I wanted to be good, and if I was conscious of my own life, then I could act in ways that were good. But he said that even though I reminded myself of this over and over again, I found myself choosing evil or delaying the good. He said, I prayed this prayer over and over again, even though I didn't want to. I love this prayer. He says, Lord, make me virtuous, but not just yet. A prayer that I think many of us have prayed. And so this is the realization that Augustine comes to, that I believe every single person who is trying to fight the evil within them eventually comes to as well. Is that we think that reason and self-control are the only tools we need to live a good life. That if I can be conscious of my good and bad things and my good and bad desires, then I can simply control the evil within me. But anyone who's actually tried to fight the evil within them comes to the same conclusion as Augustine, that we are powerless against it. We may be able to curb our behavior for a small period of time, but over the long haul, we will find ourselves praying, make me virtuous, but not just yet. And then Augustine has this incredible moment in his life. And he's with his friend, Olypius, and they're sitting down in a garden. Many of Augustine's significant ex experiences happen at a garden. Um, I don't think that's actually the garden that Augustine was sitting down. It was the third image that came up on the Google search. Okay, So I don't think they had a fountain that was quite that nice and all those other things. So he, he's sitting down at a garden with his friend Olypius, and they're talking about these monks, these monks who lived a couple towns over, and how amazed they were by these monks. Because these monks, they, they didn't have anything. They didn't have any possessions. They're talking about like how early they woke up and how late they went to bed and all these incredible things that they did. And the thing that they kept getting focused on was what incredible joy these monks exhibited over and over again, the incredible joy that they seemed to have in their life. And it says that at a certain point in time, as they were talking about this and talking about the joy, and Augustine became more and more aware of the joy that he was missing. He says that he got up and he just started pacing around the garden. He just started walking back and forth. And it says that his friend Olypius got up and he just started walking, looked down next to him and there was a Bible right there. And so he played this game of Bible roulette <laughs> where you just flip it to the first passage that you see hoping that it means something significant. And for Augustine, it worked. He said the first passage that his eyes fell upon was Romans chapter 13, starting in verse 13. And he read this. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. And he says, in that moment, everything changed for him. Because he said the thing that was so distinct to him is that it lists these different sins, these different evils within him that he had been trying so hard to get rid of. But he said the thing that stuck out to him was it doesn't say instead of drunkenness or sexual immorality or debauchery or dissension and jealousy, it doesn't say instead of that, be kind, graceful, courteous, friendly, forgiving, loving. He says, no, I realized in the moment what I've been doing wrong. That the opposite of those things is not good virtues. The opposite of those things is Jesus Christ. That he'd been spending his whole life trying to attain virtues that he did not have the power to achieve. Because those virtues and that life and that joy was actually found in Christ. And so he says it like this, that in that moment that he read it, he says, it was like light flooded my soul, erasing every shadow and erasing every dark place. As he begins to reflect on this, he makes this statement, and, and I think this is so amazing. He says, because God has made us for himself, our hearts are restless until they rest in him. 
that the reason why the joy I sought so clearly was so elusive to me is because I didn't look for it in Christ. That it was as if God has sprinkled bitterness and discontent on all of our lives that forces us to live in discontent until we find him. This is what Augustine finds, is that the reason why we have such difficulty finding joy is because our joy is in God. And then until we have him, we will not truly know an everlasting joy. But that once we find him, we have a joy that cannot be taken. This is what I found for myself, is that many people will describe um, enemies they have, or people that they have a grudge against, or people who they can't seem to get along with because of some certain scenario that has happened long in the past. And this is what I found for me, is that I am my own worst enemy. And this is, I mean that seriously, that as I look at my life, there is absolutely no one on the face of this earth who has done more to sabotage my joy than myself. There is no one who has acted so consistently to disrupt the joy that I'm seeking as I have. And what Augustine finds, and what I've found, and what I believe everybody who has actually taken an examination of their soul has found, is that we are powerless to fight the evil within us. And if you don't believe it, try it. Try to be good, not just for a day. But try to act with good desires and good motivations for a lifetime. And see if you can actually pursue it or if your call continuously over and over again is make me virtuous, but not just yet. And Augustine finds in this moment that the way that joy is found is not by achieving something, but by receiving what God has offered. That it wasn't through hard work and discipline and diligence, which is how he had achieved success in the absolute rest of his life, but that he found that joy was different. That what had happened was that God had already purchased his joy for him. And so he couldn't buy it. All he could do was receive it. And so in a moment, he realizes that his only action, his only cry, is to declare his dependency upon God to have the only thing that he truly desired. And it's the cry that everybody's found ever since. That the moment we are clearly able to articulate our dependency upon God, that in that moment we'll receive something that can never be taken. Now in that moment, a number of things change, and I, th I think this is amazing. Uh, the first thing in Augustine finds is that his desires change. That no longer was that desire for evil still there, that it was only a desire for good. Now, it took him time to work its way out in its life that he had spent a lifetime sinning and a lifetime acting on that evil desire. And so it took some time for it to make its way out in his life, but that he realizes that his desire had changed. The second thing that he finds is he said that his joy was not circumstantial. It wasn't based upon how well his job was going or how the weather was or any of these other things because his joy was found in something that couldn't be taken. The third thing that he finds, which I love the most, is that his perspective on life changes. And I believe this, for many of us, is the litmus test of whether our faith is real or not. Because for so many people, I see that their relationship with God means that they hate everything that isn't Christian or isn't churchy. And Augustine describes it completely differently is he says, when I realized that my joy was found in God, I began to see God in everything. This is an essay that he wrote. It's titled, What Do I Love When I Love My God? And these are his words. It is not physical beauty or temporal glory 
or the brightness of light dear to earthy eyes, or the sweet melodies of all kinds of songs, or the gentle odor of flowers and ointments and perfumes, or manna or honey or limbs welcoming the embraces of the flesh. It is not these I love when I love my God. Yet there is a light I love and a food and a kind of embrace when I love my God, a light, voice, odor, food, embrace of my innerness where my soul is flood lit by light which space cannot contain, where there is sound that time cannot seize, where there is a perfume which no breeze disperses, where there is a taste for food no amount of eating can lessen, where there is a bond of union that no satisfaction can part. That's what I love when I love my God. That when you realize your joy is found in God, you begin to see God in and of everything. Now, is this easy? No. In John 15, we see Jesus give an account of this, and he describes it like a vine and branches. And his statement is this. He says that my role is to cut off every branch that does not bear fruit. That what he is doing is he is removing everything within our lives that does not bring us joy in him. When you read it on a page and as a verse, it sounds pretty simple. When you've lived it, I assure you, it is very painful. Because you'll find things removed from your life that you can't explain. You'll find things taken from you that you can't quite account for. But Jesus tells us why. This is what he says at the end of that passage. He says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And I believe this is what the Christmas story is all about. It's not about a perfect manger or perfect nativity or perfect people who stood around and just talked about how great their faith was. It's about ordinary people with struggles like you and me who resisted comfort to find joy in Christ, who found that the Christmas story is about joy and not just God's joy, but yours. In Luke 2, it says this. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Fear not, For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. Let me pray for us. Father, my prayer is, is that we would find joy. And for many of us, we've explained it away as to why it is elusive to us, why it is unattainable to us. But Father, I pray that this morning we would take whatever step that is that leads to joy in you. And God, for the person who is maybe skeptical, who who wonders, is any of this true? Give them the courage to actually take a careful account of their own soul. To fight the darkness and the wickedness that's within that we all should be so consciously aware of. But maybe for some of us, we have never actually resisted. For others of us, let us receive a gift that cannot be taken. Let us understand that all the pushing, all the striving, all the angst that we have put forth in life mean nothing when it comes to you. Because you have purchased for us something that cannot be bought, but can only be received. 
And so for all the things we celebrate and all the things that we receive and all the gifts that we take at this time of year, my prayer most of all is that we would find joy in you. And I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.